Now, if I haven't met you, my name's Corey. I am one of the pastors on staff here at Hillside, and I have the privilege of opening God's word with you today. And I call it a privilege because that's what it is. That's what it is. Like, we're in this series called Jesus Asks. If you've been with us the last three weeks, we've been looking at this really crazy idea that comes from the fact, as we analyze Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus is asked 183 different questions. Now, if you're like me, I'm thinking, it's not enough questions. (laughs) Like, I ask that many questions in a week of God, but... Maybe I just have more questions. Of those 183 questions, Jesus answers three, directly three. But then on the tail end of that, as we go back to the Gospels and we look at the life of Jesus, we see that Jesus himself asks 300 questions. Now why, why bring all of this up? Why, what's, the, what's the point in all of this? Pastor Aaron said it last week, sometimes the questions that come from God have the ability to cut deeper into our souls than if God were to issue a statement. And today we have a chance to look at one such question. It's it's so strange because the text that I'm gonna open up for us today has kind of a hurt spot in my life and in my history. You see, in July of 2018, my wife and I and our family, our, our three biological children, had the chance to adopt who would become our fourth and youngest child, mainly a little curly-headed one, if you haven't put that together. She's awesome. And in doing so, the week after that adoption, I was supposed to teach here at church for what would have been my first time in my short career here at Hillside. But what many people don't know, but I'm happy to share, Because like we just sang, your name, your name is victory. That Jesus has the power to break every chain. I had to pull out of that teaching for the third time in about 14 months because my anxiety was so high, I couldn't take on the privilege of jumping up here to open God's word. And so for me, it's a privilege to get to be up here teaching because I remember the times where I felt chained to the wall, not able to use the gifts God gave me because my mental health wasn't where God wanted it to be. There was some work that had to go into it, and through that work, I have absolutely 100% experienced freedom in that area of my life. And so I'm up here today, and it's a privilege. Now, here's where things get interesting. The same passage that I was supposed to teach in July of 2018 is the one that we're gonna open up today, right? That's so crazy. So we're sitting together as a teaching team about a month ago, and Aaron had done the pre-work for this sermon series, and there's some dates where he wanted to put in Pastor Woody, myself, Aaron, like kind of three rotating teachers, and he goes, hey, who wants to take March 28th? And I was like, I'll take March 28th. Hang on, that day sounds familiar. Nope, 29th. 29th's important because it's my anniversary, but 28th, I'm free, right? You see what I did there? 13 years tomorrow, oh my gosh. We have a teenager of a marriage now. Uh, 13 years. March 28th, I'll take it. What's the topic? The topic. Why don't we go to Mark chapter 10 and we'll look at the story of the rich young ruler. Turn there with me. And as those words came to me, I was hit with this thought. I was like, hang on a second. I, I've taught that here before. Well, that's okay. They, you know, No one probably would remember if you did. I'm like... I don't, was that me or is that my fault or your fault? <laughs> like, was, that, was, that, was it not memorable or do we forget? I don't, know who's, I don't know who's to blame for that. And it was like, no, 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 it's good to have the reminder. We need the reminder. Let's jump into it. So I get on my computer and I begin to search. I do all my, all my sermon notes. I track through Google Drive because it's free and it's awesome. And so I, <laughs> I have it all in there on Google Drive and I type in rich, young, ruler. First cue that pops up, July 20th, 2018. It's like, see, I did teach it here. I open the notes. Now, I wouldn't do this. I wouldn't do this to you, beloved church. (laughs) But there is temptation when teaching something you've taught before to go, here's my notes. (laughs) I've already prepared it, ready to go. 
And so I open the notes and I start to scroll and I look, it cuts off halfway through and I'm flooded with that reminder and that memory of the Tuesday before the Sunday I was supposed to teach, having to make the call, I'm not well, I can't do this, I need someone to fill in for me. And then looking at March 28th today, Jesus asks, Mark chapter 10, rich young ruler, in some ways, there's a little bit of a redemption story and it's a privilege to be here with you today. Let's read it together. Starting at verse 17, it says, Jesus started on his way. A man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared. All these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said. Go, sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. At this, as this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed and said to each other, well, who then can be saved? And Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Let's pray together. Spirit of God, I ask that you would, that you would do what was promised upon your appearance in our lives. The ability to discern the voice of God, the ability to dissect our hearts, to reveal to us what is off, to encourage us in where we're stepping into faith to provide room for repentance where we have put God things in the place of you, O oh Lord. Spirit, I pray that your words would come through loud and clear to us as your church, both in person and online today. We love you, and it is indeed a privilege to get to do this today. It's in your name we pray, amen. Amen. So as I shared earlier, my family and I have adopted our youngest child, and she's the best. But there was a part of her life where she had to go to court-ordered visitations twice a week for a number of years, about two years, first two years she was in our lives. And those visitations grew increasingly difficult as her time with us went on, and so my wife had this brilliant idea that only a mother could come up with, where she said, hey, what if we started packing her a backpack? I'm like, sounds great. What are we going to put in like a, what goes in the backpack? And she's like, well, we'll put a lunch We'll put a change of clothes, we'll, we'll put a stuffed animal, and, and it could be kind of a security blanket for her. And so from then on, for two years, my little daughter would put the backpack over her arm as she got out of the car, and she would march into the visitation center, and she would come out holding the backpack, and she would get in the car twice a week for two years. But then there came a day. There came a day where the court system decided that visitation was no longer a thing that sister had to participate in. And this was a huge step for us in being able to adopt this little one. And we were so excited that God had gone before us. We were thrilled to be used by God and to have a part in her story. And, and the fact that this is where the judge decided it should go. We're just going, we're of service, whatever we can do. And so the visitations are all done. And one day I'm cleaning out the car and I come across the backpack that had been pushed to the side, covered in socks and sand and Chick-fil-A and all the things that get stuck in our cars, right? Right? My wife's car, not my car. Uh, my car's very clean. Um, not true. And I pulled the backpack out of the car, and as I'm about to put it into that shelf into the garage, we all have this shelf, the one that you put something there and you're like, I'll deal with it later, right? I think for a lot of us, that's just called the garage. Uh, it's not even a shelf, it's just the garage. Uh, and so I go to put this on the shelf in the garage, and as I do, I hear her sweet little footsteps come out and say, what, what are you doing? I said, oh, we don't need the backpack anymore. And she goes, but it's my backpack. And I was like, whoa. I mean, 
technically, it's my backpack, you know, <laughs> bought it for you. Uh, she goes, that's my backpack, it's, it's special to me. And I said, well, this backpack represents something that we don't have to participate in anymore. So we'll use the other backpack, the one you use for school or when we go to the, go to the beach or what have you, but this one we don't need anymore. And she goes, but that's my backpack. And I was like, what if we put the backpack in the garage, daddy promised mommy I'll clean the garage, so we'll come back to the backpack, and I could just see in her life, in her mind, the gears turning, the hurt, the comfort, the security, the memories. She was not ready to accept the fact that this wasn't something she needed anymore, given the opportunity that she had in front of her. The story of the rich young ruler screams that similar lesson, and so I'd love to work through verse by verse and break it down together today, church. Verse 17. As Jesus was on his way, a man ran up to him, fell on his knees before him, and said, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? We're introduced to a man. I find it interesting that we don't get his name. There's no name. It's not Joe or Bob or Rawl. There's no name attached to it. It's just rich, young ruler. Now, unless I'm missing something, and rich is his first name, young's his middle, and ruler's his last, we don't get a name for Mr. Rich Young Ruler, but what we do get is a description for what he's known by. We look at the first word, rich. This is going to imply that this man had wealth in verse 17. Now, wealth in the first century could have been a bank account, but most likely it was property and possessions, things that other people could see and go, oh, he's got something I don't have. He's wealthy, young, Young implies, well, I mean, I'm young, I guess, you know, like you could maybe use me as the model if I'm just kidding, 34 now, but young, meaning he's not an old man, he's a young man, that one's simple to wrap our minds around, right? Ruler, things get really interesting at ruler. You see, Israel during the first century as Jesus walked the earth was under Roman rule, Roman occupancy, Rome was in charge, which means there's not going to be a Roman uh, soldier, a centurion, a Caesar's not going to run up to Jesus and kneel and say, good teacher. They're not going to do that with Jesus. Why? Because, well, they're in charge of him. Technically, Jesus was Jewish, so a Roman's not going to do that. So ruler, what authority does this guy have if he's not a part of the governmental structure at his time? Scholars believe that the rich young ruler could have been someone who held a high place of authority in the synagogue, Church, meaning this was someone who would have known the Torah. This is someone who would have had it memorized. This is someone who would have known the rituals, who would have understood the law, who would have understood the promise of a Messiah to come. We see this played out in the way that he approaches Jesus. He calls him good teacher. Now, I don't know about you, but I was not raised in a Christian home. Maybe online, put in the chats or in the room, if you were not raised in a Christian home, raise your hand. I'm not a church person. I'm a transplant. When I was 18 years old, I went to a summer camp and heard the gospel and put my faith in Jesus just before my 19th birthday. Before that, church was a place that we went to on Easter, some people are like, do we go by the calendar? Is it Easter first? Is it Christmas? Do we go by the gifts of the baskets, the eggs of Christmas and Easter? Whatever the format we want to use. Go to church on Christmas and Easter. Now listen, I believed Jesus was probably a good teacher. I believed Jesus embodied the golden rule. Do unto others as you'd have them do unto, unto you. I understood that Christianity was a religion, and if someone was a Christian, they were probably a good person. This was my understanding until almost 19 of who and what Christians were, more specifically who and what Jesus was. I can't help but wonder if my view of Jesus isn't the same view as the rich young rulers. He says, good teacher. Meaning, he understands that there's something good about Jesus. That's what drew him to him. You're not going to run up to someone and kneel before them showing respect, showing a desire, complimenting them, puffing them up if there's not something going on here. And so his question, what must I do to inherit eternal life, is an interesting one. In fact, I think that question of what must I do to inherit eternal life God, what do I need to do to go to heaven when I die? I think that question is probably the single most driving question that fills churches on weekends. What must I do to go to heaven when I die? 
I'm so thankful that Jesus takes the time to respond to this question because I think many of us wander through life having this same question at the forefront of our minds when things get hard, scary, health is a concern, death becomes real and tangible. So let's look at Jesus' response. In verse 18, here's our question for the day. Jesus says, why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, you shall not defraud, honor your father and mother. Jesus replies to this question with a question. And the question Jesus replies with is simple. Hold up, Mr. Rich, young ruler. Why do you call me good? But we have to understand that we all know this, right? Like, Bible is written in a different language a long time ago. And so if you jump into a word study on the word good that Jesus uses here in this passage, it's a Greek word called agathos, meaning of good, intrinsic goodness, of good being. Like, in other words, he's, he, Jesus is replying, why do you call me good through and through? We could call it, like, good, good. Oh, you're not just saying I'm good, like I was nice to the, the checker at, at Starbucks on my way out. You're saying like I'm good, good? Is that what you're asking me? And in his follow-up, he further clarifies, clarifies, hey, you know that no one's good except God alone, right? As if to say, are you calling me a good guy or are you calling me a good God? Because there's a big difference between those two beliefs. Like a good guy is worthy of respect and praise, but a good God is worthy of praise and worship. Like a good guy can make us feel better about ourselves, but a good God can save sinners from an eternity separated from a good God. A good guy can, can maybe arouse the crowds to do something meaningful with their lives, but a good God has put purpose in every single person within the sound of my voice, and he desires to use you in ways in his ever-expanding kingdom through your mind, your gifts, your voice, your talents, your abilities here on earth and on into eternity. That's a good God. There's a difference. There's a difference. Got a little preachy there. Okay. He goes on to say, verse 19... You know the commandments, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, you shall not defraud, honor your father and mother, you're calling me good, but you've read the 10 commandments, right? Like the most basic laws that we have, what do they say? Jesus, interestingly, in this moment, goes on to list the commandments that would have made up the right side of the tablet, the ones more specifically that have to do with how we treat other humans, how humans treat humans. Jesus kind of throws out a measuring stick. Oh, you're, you called me good teacher. No one's good except God alone. In fact, let's raise up what goodness is, what goodness could be defined as. Are you good to other people? He immediately replies with this. Teacher, he declared. He didn't say, well, actually, Jesus. He didn't say, well, hang on there, rabbi. He didn't say, question. He declares it. All of these things I have kept from my youth. I've done all of them. Well, now we have a problem, because now we have the rich young ruler essentially saying he's perfect. And his measuring stick of how his perfection could be gauged in the eyes of God was how he treated other people. And I think if we're not careful, the roots and seeds of religion can grow into our hearts and make us think that the point of faith is simply how we treat others But that's not it. Jesus said when he was questioned in Matthew 22, what what is the greatest law that we could follow? He says, well, all the law and all the commandments can be summed up into two things. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Interesting, it seems like the rich young ruler is kind of skipping over the first part. I followed all those rules. I've been a good person. And how many people today feel as though it's them being a good person that should put them in good standing with this good God? But Scripture teaches a different narrative. In fact, 1 John chapter, 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 would say this. Let's turn there. This is important stuff. 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 says, If we claim, if we claim to be without sin, what is sin? Real fun day at church, awesome. Sin is this, 
any thought, deed, word, attitude, or action that goes against God's perfect being, sin. Another way, a less churchy way to imply what sin could be could be called evil, darkness. This is what sin is. 1 John 1.8 says, if we claim to be without sin, meaning I have no darkness in my life, I have never contributed to the evil that exists in the world. I'm a good person. I treat other people good. I am not a sinner. He says we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, however, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. Jesus is trying to gauge the place for him to enter into the life of the rich young ruler. Hey, buddy, if you have it all together, what do you need from me? We gotta go back to verse 17. What he wanted from God was what? To go to heaven when he died. He wanted to go to the good place, not the bad place. In a life filled with success and achievement and accolades and accomplishment, we see someone trying to add one more to the way that they chose to live their lives the most crown jewel of all accomplishments to go to heaven when they passed. And when Jesus lays out the measuring stick, the law, the law, all of the Old Testament we can summarize into 613 do's and do nots made up known as the law. And this guy's saying, no, I followed the law perfectly. I know of one person who did that and it made him worthy to be our sacrifice. We're not good people. We don't possess the ability to be sinless. If we did, there would be no need to be here today singing songs like your name, your name is victory. The reason we sing that is because Jesus has conquered the grave. Jesus was risen from the dead. He took upon himself the punishment, the wrath of God for our sins so that we could experience new life starting now on into eternity. That's the gospel. In fact, the the book of Romans says this in in, in Romans chapter 3, verses 19 through 20. It says this about the law. Again, we're just teasing out the idea, can any of us be good enough to inherit eternal life apart from God? Can we do it? He says this, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, meaning if you're going to use moral goodness as the way to gauge how successful you are in life, specifically spiritually, then you've got to use the law. And if you're going to use the law, then you're going to be graded by the law. Is that what you want to do? If you want to say, I should go to heaven because I was a good person, God says, well, then I have to use the law against you, and there's no way you could follow all of it. In fact, he goes on to say, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world count, held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. The purpose of the law... The purpose of destroying a system that said be a good person was to prove that no one could be good enough on their own volition. Therefore, God had to come and conquer and save. If you want to live by the law, you're going to have to die by the law. But if you want to live by grace, then you can die by grace too. Let's look at Jesus' response. Jesus looked at him and loved him. Pause. It says, Jesus looked at him and loved him. He looked at him with kindness, with care, with compassion, with love. And he said, one thing you lack, go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. There's just one thing you lack. And in fact, it's the thing in your life that has left you no room for me to enter into it. It's your wealth. It's the reason we don't know your name. It's the reason we only know your identity as rich, young ruler. Jesus says, you've got to squash that identity so that I can become your identity. You've got to get rid of that thing that's taking up all the space in your soul that I would love to fill my spirit into and occupy and speak to you and renew you. My promise of life everlasting is yours, but here's what you've got to do. Get rid of that stuff. And then Jesus doesn't say that you can be with me when you die. He says, come and follow me now, here today. In this same book, in Mark chapter 1, verse 13, Jesus on the shores of the Jordan River said, repent and believe for the kingdom of heaven is here. 
Meaning I'm not waiting for heaven when my heart stops beating. I'm experiencing it in the way that I interact with my church community, in the way that I choose to raise my children, in the love and relational intimacy that I have with my life, in my spiritual friendships. That's where I get to experience the kingdom of God. It's not waiting for my heart to stop beating. It's what makes my heart beat to experience that kingdom of God. Jesus is writing a lot of bad theology here. He says, hey, you just gotta get rid of that thing that's keeping you from me. That's all that I ask. I think as we look at the tail end of this passage, there's two ways that we could interpret it. The first way that we can interpret this passage is a way that I have heard. I remember as a kid, one of those Christmas, one of those Easter sermons, it's still in my brain, and it's the way that says, you can't have wealth. We all should be poor, we should all give everything away, and then God will love us. We live in America. I don't think it's a stretch to say that most of us have it pretty good. Now, I'm not saying that there's not oppression. I'm not saying that there's not crazy, shady business happening around every turn. I'm not saying that at all. But I'm saying for those of us watching and listening and hearing this message today, we're here. We got clothes. No one's naked. Like, we're all in the room, right? We, we made it. We did it. The type of wealth Jesus is talking about is the kind of wealth that can be built up as a wall between you and God. The type of wealth that Jesus is talking about is the kind of wealth that would replace your need for God. It's the kind of wealth that you would worship instead of God. It's the kind of wealth that would take your eyes off of God. It's the kind of wealth that, in its own right, would become a bit of a God itself. Mr. Rich Young Ruler had this problem. He was in violation of breaking the first commandment. One of the laws that he said, all of these I've kept since I was a youth. One that said, you should have no other gods before me except me. Let's talk about money for a second because that's always comfortable. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17 through 19 say this. This is Paul giving charge to a young pastor in his care named Timothy. And he says, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope, I'm sorry, uh, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous, willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take a hold of life that is truly life. Wealth is talked about as a gift. There's strong caution against worshiping wealth, but it's talked about as something that, that can really help the kingdom of God grow. This church wouldn't be here if it weren't for the wealth of others. There wouldn't be a staff here if it weren't for the wealth of others. What Jesus is cautioning against is when we allow wealth to become our object of worship. So we can conclude that what this passage is not about is that we should all be poor and give everything away so that we can go to heaven when we die. Rather, there's an exchange God isn't saying, I want you to be poor. God is saying, I want to be your everything. God isn't saying, I want your Sunday. He's saying, I want every part of you. God isn't saying, I I want that little bit that you give me when you watch the sermon online or when you go to church on the weekend or when you do your Bible study with your girls, right? God's saying, I want all of you. Those things are an expression, an outward expression of the relationship we have. I want every single part of you. And in that exchange, we get to be with him from now until eternity. In that exchange, we get a chance to be with God forever. Now, Jesus' response was confusing even to the disciples. Look at what he said. Jesus said, at this the man's face fell and he went away sad because he had great wealth. He was not willing to give it all up, so he walks away sad. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Pause. Have you ever heard this crazy story that there was a gate in Israel And that gate was known as the eye of the needle. And in order to pass through it, livestock and man would have to get on their knees and crawl. Have you heard that before? 
Yeah, the idea behind it is that like, you can have great wealth, you can have things, but in order to come to God, you just have to be on your knees. It's a total lie, by the way. Like the dude who came up with that illustration came out later and said like, yeah, I made that up. There's no historical or archeological evidence for there being such gate known as the eye of the needle. So what can we conclude then? We can conclude that it would be impossible to put a camel through the eye of the needle. I can hardly put the string through when my daughter wants me to set up her sewing machine, let alone a two-humped camel. Like, that's not happening. The disciples aren't thinking of some magical gate like, oh, so you have to be on your knees. What's their response? The disciples were even more amazed. And they said to each other, well, then who can be saved? This sounds impossible. You can't put a camel through the eye of a needle, Jesus. Like, what, are you just saying rich people don't get to go to heaven then? What are you even saying? Jesus replied, he looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. And so if you're sitting there today just thinking about maybe some of those idols that have made up your life, if you're sitting there today thinking that like my daughter's story, you have this backpack filled with things that you refuse to get rid of, Maybe things that would be indicators of influence. Things that would be indicator of a brand. Things that would be indicators of your public facing self. This is my daughter's iPod, by the way. It's very cute. Maybe this is one of the things God's saying, hey, get rid of that. It has no purpose for what I'm trying to do in your life. Maybe for others of us, it's things that, that bring us comfort. It's things that make us feel good. It's things that help us cope with the pain. It's habits or attitudes or thoughts that we frequent because we know that in the midst of a hard life, I can turn to this to feel warmth because turning to this sounds really hard. God would say, I can be this for you. I would love to be this for you. But in order for me to be this for you, you've got to make room for me in your life so you're going to have to get rid of this. And maybe still for others of us, it's a pretty pink wallet. I wonder if my daughter has any money. I really, oh my gosh. That's where all my money's been going. Are you, I swear I just looked. I had not opened this yet. Maybe I'm gonna read her text messages now too. Holy cow. Um, that was real time, by the way. I'm kind of shocked. Um, I have to go. <laughs> I think for some of us still, we, we turn to our bank accounts. We turn to the hope of a retirement someday. We turn to the hope of more degrees, more accomplishment, more success. Now I'm not saying, let's be clear, what I'm not saying is that these things are bad things. Unless you got that money from me, then that's a bad thing. Uh, but what I am saying, when we make good things a God thing, we have an idol. Even things that aren't intrinsically bad can take away our need to worship and depend upon Jesus. Even things that aren't intrinsically bad can become humongous distractions in our lives. You know my two, I'll just be vulnerable. My two, I would encourage you as we wrap up our time together to think about your two. My two are on my left hand. The two things that most often get in between me and God are my relationships and my time. If I'm not careful, I can use my relationships as an excuse to say no to things God would have me enter into. In the name of boundaries, in the name of time, I can use even my marriage, the most holy and blessed of relationships I have apart from the one I have with God, I can use that as a crutch to say no to things God would have me step and enter into. And that doesn't make me a super husband, by the way, because I don't think my wife appreciates feeling idolized, the pressure that that puts on her. The, the, the lack of godliness that that builds in me is not something, I'm, I'm not using my marriage as a good example. I'm saying my relationships most often come in between me and God. I'll make time for people before I make time for God. I'll, I'll serve others because I want them to accept me a lot easier than I'll serve God if I'm vulnerable with you. The other is my time. I'm very stingy with it. I often waste it. I'm really good at squandering an hour. I can lay in bed on an endless social feed and get nothing done 
and just like, whew, that's, that was an hour. Whoopsie daisy, <laughs> we're in trouble now. Like those are my things. Like as I consider this, sell all that you have, come and be with me, the things that I have to really watch in my life, the things that I have to get rid of is the desire to hoard my time and the desire to put my relationships above the one I have with God. Did you know though that there's a story in scripture of someone who was faced with this same exact opportunity, but they did? The Apostle Paul, in the book of Philippians, chapter three, he says this in verse seven, but whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. You've got one guy who walked away sad. You have another who said, that was the best exchange I've ever made in my life. That was the most worthy investment I've ever made. And in the beginning parts of this chapter, he goes on and on and on about his accomplishments, only at the part where we picked up to say it was trash, wasn't worth it. He says, uh, compared to, I consider everything a loss um, because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I've lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, not having a righteousness of my own that I assumed I can attain through the ways that I treat others. I'm a good person. God, see, I did good things. Not a righteousness that comes through, look, I followed every rule, I never messed up. The point of those things is that you can never be a good enough person. You can never follow the law. That's why Jesus vacated the throne in heaven, came to earth to provide a way for us to be with God starting today on into eternity. He says, I wanna know Christ. I wanna know the power of his resurrection I want to participate in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining the resurrection from the dead. Paul says to the church that he writes this letter to, I made that exchange. It came with suffering, it came with hardship, but if I can be honest, I consider everything else I had trash compared to what I gained in following God. I consider it all a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I lost all things. So what is it for you? What is that thing that as I've talked and talked and talked that you sense the spirit of God saying, let's get rid of this? What is that thing? Is it a picture perfect family? Is it athletic kids? Is it a retirement? Is it wealth? What is that thing coming in between you and deeper intimacy with God? There's an invitation, an opportunity on the table for us to get rid of those things so that we can experience life to the full beginning here and now. Let's pray. God, today we we come to you like David did in Psalm 139, where he said, search me, O God, and know me. See if there's any offensive way in me, and lead me to the way everlasting. Jesus, as we wrap up our time together on this Palm Sunday, a day that it just symbolizes the triumphal entry that you had as you went to the cross, in the same way they laid down palm fronds and cloaks God, would we lay down our lives for you to step over, for you to be exalted upon, for you to be lifted up on? Would the point and purpose of our lives be you and you alone? We love you. And maybe in this moment, church, however you're participating in this gathering, identify what that thing is that God could be saying, give this up. And instead of saying amen, just before we sing a song that reflects on the goodness of the God we've talked about, I want to give you a few seconds to pray. God, I give this to you. It's yours. Would you take it so that there can be room for you in my life? Pray that now, and then we'll worship together.